Well, as usual, disclaimer. The following will contain spoilers for 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim. If you're not into spoilers, either choose to click out of this video now, or watch someone's playthrough of the game, preferably mine, but I won't complain. Or even better, purchase the game for yourself and play because the experience truly is wonderful. Anyway, on that note, let's. if you're still here, you're either alright with spoilers or you already know what the hell I'm talking about. So, let's get this show on the road! I always wanted to say that, you know, honestly. You know, honesty, honestly. <laughs> on today's episode of 13 Sentinels Aegis Room Character Files, we'll be discussing about Yuki Takamiya. As usual, starting in chronological order, we'll be first discussing the 2188 Yuki Takamiya. The 2188 Yuki Takimiya was a major and important part of, well, the Interstellar Development Project and Project Art as a whole. If you want more information, please uh, click on, as I'm, I'm pretty sure my Interstellar Development Project uh, explanation is a part of the playlist for my character file. So, do click on it if you need more exposition or are simply curious about how I view the in the Interstellar Development Project and Project Art as a whole. Anyway, the 2188 Yuki Takamiya's role in the Interstellar Development Project was very important because of the fact that she created the self-replicating probes that would oversee many aspects of the project including the space travel, the space fairing, the data transfer, the data storage, as well as eventually leading... Le uh, no, not leading as well as eventually creating the command probes that would take charge of cultivating or terraforming a planet, which is, um, well, as you can see, Yuki Takemiya's research into self-replicating pro probes was the only thing that allowed the interstellar development project to even become feasible, because using normal space travel, no human would survive the trip. As shown by... Tomi Kisaragi's um, research into terraforming, it takes near millennia, near one or two millennia for a planet to be properly terraformed to become habitable for human life. And I'm fairly sure no matter how advanced their technology was, it was impossible for them to make it so that a human being would go past 200 years old. And as usual, the first and second loop Yuki Takemiya, there is absolutely no information on them, so we'll skip immediately to the events of the game, with the third loop. We can infer that most of Yuki Takemiya's storyline takes place uh, about a little, over, a little over a few days after Natsuno Minami's storyline concluded, because most of Yuki Takemiya's storyline consists of her researching investigating, and searching for the missing Natsuno Minami. Of course, the simulation and universal control pretty much just uh, rewrote the data and make all the AIs believe that Natsuno was just sick or something. But uh, Yuki, being one of the 15 survivors, wasn't, uh, wasn't really... Well, actually... Being, a fi being one of the survivors had nothing to do with it. Universal control still has some extension of control over their memories now. Yuki Takamiya simply won't believe that Natsuno would just mysteriously disappear, run away, or even fall sick for such a long period of time. So she started using her connection to the SIU via Ida Tetsuya and the, and the special agents anyway to investigate. She would eventually meet Aiseki Gahara, who would then help her go rescue Natsuno in the future. Though I say the future, us as the viewer already knows that what the time frame I'm speaking of is 2025, which is Sector 3. Anyway, Yuki would successfully rescue Natsuno and bring her back to Sector 2. And uh, later down the line, she would also help Aiseki Gahara jumpstart his memories again by bringing BJ to him. Because she felt a sense of, what do you call it? Indebtment? No, gratitude. She did not want to leave a debt 
unpaid due to the fact that A. Sekigahara had immensely helped her. Oh, and uh, before all that, she was also being stalked by Juro Izumi, or should I say, prisoner number 426 inside Tamao Kurabe's android body. We already know that uh, after Tamao Kurabe, or sh yeah, Tamao Kurabe, the AI from the second loop, f found and confronted Prisoner 426 inside the Tomi Kisaragi android in Natsuno Minami's portion of the story. 426 managed to hijack the android body from Tamao Kurabe after, being de after the Tomi Kisaragi body was destroyed, which he would then use to transfer the key. He transferred the key from Nenji Ogata over to Natsuno Minami, and then he would uh, he would then program BJ to bring her to 1945 Sector One. The reason for that is because 426 needed to buy time. The kaiju would usually attack in order. Would usually attack in order of who possesses the key. So it kept shifting after every sector. The reason why he programmed BJ to bring Natsuno to, to Sector 1 was so that the Kaiju would ignore Sector 2 for now and immediately go attack Sector 1 following the command signal being well broadcasted by the key that was put inside Natsuno Minami. Prisoner number 426 also took advantage of uh, being close to Yuki Takamiya to not only un unlock her Sentinel, Sentinel authorization so that she could pilot her Sentinel, but also to modify her a bit so that she wouldn't uh, find Natsuno too soon. He wanted to make sure Natsuno remained in the different time in the different sectors as long as possible to keep the kaiju preoccupied from attacking sector 2 so that he would have more time to get everyone ready to fight back against the kaiju. She would then join the fight against the kaiju and later fell in love with Shu Amiguchi because, well, they already have a daughter. Apparently, their daughter looks exactly like Natsuno, which makes a lot of sense considering that uh, Natsuno was the twin Natsuno Minami and Yuki Takamiya in 2188 were mother and daughter. So biologically, they are indeed very, very close to each other. Like, in terms of cloning, since they're the same age, you could consider them step siblings. They're that close. Uh, biologically, from a biological perspective, anyway. Uh, sorry, I'm so repetitive. Uh, so, Yuki would also show symptoms of jealousy. <laughs> she, Though she and Shu have a decent relationship as a couple, she has shown to also be the jealous type as when Shu Amiguchi flirted with Ryoko Shinonomi, Yuki got very angry and decided to start ignoring him. So much so that Natsuno had to guilt trip Yuki into, Don't do this, Yuki. Remember Konatsu, your daughter. She can't grow up in a fatherless environment. <laughs> Man, that is one heavy guilt trip. Shuamiguchi though would show remorse, trying to uh, blame, trying to blame as he quote, "They are just remnants of Ida Tetsuya's memories, so it's not his fault." But Yuki did not forgive him so easily. She did. She does forgive him eventually though. It doesn't take that long. Yuki is actually not that uh, stone-hearted. In fact, one could say that she's proven to be quite soft of heart. Though she has a though she has some violent tendencies due to her brawling nature, she has also proven to be a girl with a heart of gold. And with that, that concludes our character file of Yuki Takamiya. Yeah, it's pretty short. Next time. Wait, let me do a Dragon Ball Z voice. <clears throat> Next time on Aegis Rim Character Files. Wait, I forgot the 13 Sentinels. I made a horrible narrator. Next time on 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim Character Files, we will be talking about the daughter of Yuki Takamiya, Konatsu. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. That would be the shortest video ever. That would barely even go for 30 seconds because the only thing we know of Konatsu is exactly what I just said. We will be discussing. Natsuno Minami, the girl 
who traveled everywhere in time, but not really. So, on that note, uh, end screen, end screen, end screen. Like, comment, subscribe, and thank you very much for, well, viewing my channel, watching my channel, listening to my voice, ramble on, uh, any of the three. So, with that, I bid you a fond farewell, and hope to see you next time. Bye!